guys, we want to talk about sound today. So let's talk about the warm-up for a minute. What does the period of the pendulum depend on? Does it depend on the angle? No. 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 So on that first question on the warm-up, the angle doesn't matter. You can ignore it. Does it depend on the mass? No. 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 Ignore all the masses. What's the only thing that matters? The length. The length. The longer the pendulum, the greater the period. So to figure out which one has the greatest period, find the longest one. That's it. You don't have to look at anything else. Everything else is a distractor. So the longest period is the longest pendulum. The shortest period is the shortest pendulum. So I think B was the longest one, I think. I forget. The second one, you had to do a calculation. So you had to calculate the period, 2 pi squared of m over k. But the 2B was actually an easy one. What happens if you make the mass 100 times bigger? So remember, the period of a mass on a spring, the period of mass on a spring is 2 pi square root of m over k. If you make the mass 100 times bigger, what happens to the period? It gets 10 times bigger. So it just makes your answer from 2a 10 times bigger. You don't need a calculator to do that, I don't think, right? All right, so we're going to talk about sound today. Um, and uh, we'll get some uh, new problems. You should be pretty close to solving and finishing those problems from yesterday, right? We did most of them in class. Some of you are a little backed up, and so you came into class not having finished 8.2. So you use class time to do 8.2, and you just feel like you're always behind. So um, that's just how life's going to feel until you really just make an effort to stay caught up, okay? Start letting things slide and it just gets overwhelmed, right? Feel like you're behind a snowball that just never stops rolling down the hill and getting bigger and bigger. Okay, these equations should look familiar to you. The first one's called the wave equation. The velocity of a wave is equal to its wavelength times its frequency. And the frequency and the period are reciprocals. Okay, we did that yesterday. That's what we solved the problems on. And we threw in a couple met metric prefixes. Okay? So what we're going to do today is talk about a sound wave. So sound is what we call a mechanical longitudinal pressure wave. And I just want you to have an idea of what those three words mean. So first of all, what does it mean if it's a mechanical wave? Well, a mechanical engineer is somebody who deals with things that have mass and position and velocity and interact. A mechanic is somebody who deals with the parts of your car that physically interact with each other. There's stuff there, there's mass. This is opposed to an electrical engineer that are, are dealing with electrons, for example, or something. So mechanical simply means that there has to be a physical medium. There has to be actual stuff there. This is different than a light wave, which passes through an electric field. Okay? An electric field is not a physical medium. A physical medium is one that's actually there. You can touch it. You can feel it. Okay? It's a longitudinal wave, so it's a mechanical wave, so it needs stuff to travel through. What does sound travel through? How is the sound getting from me to you? What's it traveling through? It's traveling through air. If we sucked all the air out of the room, you couldn't hear me at all. You'd also die, but, you know, minor side effect. It'd be cool for a couple seconds. It's a longitudinal wave, which means that the medium, the air molecules, move in the same direction as the wave. They wiggle back and forth. So this is a visualization. Imagine a loudspeaker pushing air molecules. Those pressure waves travel down, and the medium moves in the same direction. So it's a longitudinal wave. And the third thing is that it's a pressure wave. If I were to take a snapshot of the, the wave right there, you would see some places the air molecules are bunched up, and some places they are far apart. Close your computer there, please, Tracy. Right here, where they are bunched up, they're all stuck together. We call that a compression, and in the areas where they're far apart, we call that a rarefaction. You don't need to know those names. But what happens is, if I were to graph the pressure, when they're all together, the pressure is high, but when they're spread apart, the pressure is low. But with a sound wave, if you ask, what is it that's waving? It's the pressure that's going up and down. Okay? The molecules are all bunching up and spreading out, but the pressure is going up and down. 
And that's why I sound as a pressure wave. If you dive to the bottom of the swimming pool, what hurts? Your ears. Why do your ears hurt? Because they are your pressure sensors. Sound is a pressure wave. So your ears are pressure sensors. And that's why they hurt when you dive down, right? You get a sore ear, a little bit of pressure, or you take it off in an airplane or something, and your ears can really hurt. That's because they are the pressure sensors. So, sound is a pressure longitudinal, me uh, mechanical longitudinal pressure wave. So, I just want to take a quick look at some examples of sound waves. So, is anybody in the uh, choir willing to help us out here? Who are you voting for? Elise? I said, who are you voting for? Oh, Katie. Katie, all right. Katie, no, you're not going to do it. Oh, Lauren's going to do it. Yeah. Rock, paper, scissors. We just got to come sing us some notes. Go ahead. Take me a minute to set up while you guys are deciding. No. Oh, come on. Wait, wait. I'll sing with you. Oh, so, you, oh, so if you and Katie both come out, you'll do it? I'm going to probably sing with you. All right, fine. I will substitute. We're just going to replace Katie and Lauren and McGuire with a tuning fork. That's it. You're out. Put this on. So, here's what's going to happen. We've already played with this a little bit, so um, I need a little bit of help. So, uh, I just need you to hold the microphone. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to produce pressure waves by smacking on a tuning fork. And if I do that, uh-oh. Got to get ready for this. Okay. There we go. Let's try one more. There. Thanks. So what we have here is a pressure wave. When I smack the tuning fork, it's got two pieces of metal that vibrate back and forth. Just like if you take a stick, a meter stick, and you clamp it to the table, if I pull it back, it vibrates. There's a restoring force. If I pull it back, the tension in the, in the stick tries to make it go back there. If I push it, it wants to go back there, so it vibrates. So a tuning fork just has two of those, and they're metal, and they move back and forth. And you guys are gonna do this lab on Monday. You're gonna have a tuning fork, and you're gonna thump it, and you're going to measure its wave. And we want to find the frequency of the tuning fork, or the frequency of the cycle, how many cycles there are. So the way we're going to do that, and we'll do this in lab on Monday, so I'm going to do it really quickly. I'm going to go to Analyze, Exam, and grab your calculators. The very top of the last wave is 0 0.0284 seconds. So what we're going to do is um, P2 is 0 0.0284 seconds. That's the time at the top of that pressure wave. The very first one, the time at the very first one, the tippy top of it, is 0 0.0019. So we'll call this P1 equals 0 0.0019 seconds. So the question is, how much time did it take for the pressure to go from here to there? So take the difference. What's the time? 0 0.0265, is that right? Everybody get that? All right, now let's count how many waves that is. We started right here. So from there to there is one wave. That's two waves, three waves, four waves, five waves, six, seven, eight. That was nine waves. So this time, in this amount of time, there were nine waves. So what is the period of a wave? How long does it take one wave to go by if nine waves goes by in this amount of time? So the period of one wave is 0 0.0265 seconds divided by nine waves. And, got that, Elise? Um, that 
Turn it up, Tracy. Make sure she's right. What'd you get, Elise? We'll see if it's safe to do. Really loud. Something like that? Okay, that is seconds. Right? That's the number of seconds it takes for one wave to go by. Now, we could have gotten close if we just took from there to there, right? We just said, what's the time here? What's the time there? But it's pretty hard to tell where the top of that wave is. So the more waves we do, the more accurate we're going to be. All right, so if that's the period, what is the frequency of the wave? How do you find frequency? One over the period. So take one over your last answer, and you'll have the frequency. What is the frequency of that? 340? 340 hertz. That's the frequency at which my replacement for Lauren and Katie was singing. And if I had enough different ones, I could make any musical note. So these tuning forks have slightly different lengths. I've got some short ones and some long ones. The short ones vibrate faster, just like if my stick was short, it would vibrate faster. Oops. It vibrates pretty fast, and if it's long, it vibrates slower. Okay? So a tuning fork produces sound waves, and we can measure those pressure waves, and we can find their frequency. Okay? And you guys are going to do that in lab on Monday. All right? It's one of the parts of the lab. So what's happening is this tuning fork, the, the two tines, are wobbling back and forth 340 times a second. In one second, it goes 340 times back and forth. And it sends out those pressure waves. The air molecules knock their neighbors. And those waves get to your ear. And your ear, you got a little membrane there and it wiggles with the pressure waves, and it's got some little tiny bones in there. There's a hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. You guys remember the anatomy of the ear? Vaguely. Anyway, it, uh, it produces uh, electrical signals to your brain, and you hear sound, okay? So we can detect pressure waves from sound. So when the tuning fork is smacked, what's going on is something like this. As the time wiggles back and forth, pressure waves spread out. They actually go in three dimensions, so they're kind of going in all directions. That any time you produce a sound wave, you need something that can vibrate, that can oscillate. That's how we produce sound waves. So your ear, here's the anatomy of your ear. You've got a little tiny membrane, and it's very thin. Okay, it's called the tympanic membrane or the eardrum. That's why you don't stick things in your ear, right? Don't puncture it. It's connected to some little tiny bones. Those bones are connected to a canal. And as the sound waves smack against you, the fluid in this little, it's a, called the cochlea, it sloshes back and forth. And there's little tiny hairs floating in that fluid. And as they move, they send electrical signals to the brain. And that's how you hear. Some, uh, well, some people who are deaf have um, problems with the cochlea. They can't uh, pick up those signals. The fluid doesn't slosh around. So my niece is, was born deaf. She can't hear at all, completely deaf. Her cochlea doesn't function. So they wired an implant in so that it picks up the sound waves electronically and stimulates the nerve at here. And it's the most amazing thing. She was three years old. And she had this surgery, and two weeks later, when everything was healed, they flipped a button, and she could hear. It was just like they did it. It depends why you go deaf. If you go deaf because of nerve damage, they can't help you. Okay, but if you go deaf because of mechanical problems anywhere else, a cochlear implant solves it. So that was like 12 years ago, and then last year she got an upgrade. They put a new one in because her old was getting old and wasn't working. They had better, and her new one has Bluetooth. It is so cool. She can like connect her iPad to her brain. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Since she don't need that. Like, it's <laughs> Yeah, kind of cool. All right, so when we talk about sound waves, we use some different words sometimes, okay? Mostly to connect to the musical people. We talk about frequency of waves, but when we're talking about the frequency of a sound wave, 
We also call it the pitch. Okay? So pitch is another word for frequency. A higher pitch means a higher frequency. A lower pitch means a lower frequency. Less waves per second. Okay? So this tuning fork, we decided it was 340. Let's hear that. That's 340. This is 512. It's a higher frequency, a higher pitch. So frequency and pitch are the same thing. Okay. Humans can hear a pretty good range of frequencies. <laughs> can you guys hear this? Let's know what this is. I'm making really big pressure waves. I'm making three every second. You can't hear that? No. How many do I have to make every second for you to hear? Well, humans need somewhere around 20 waves per second to pick it up, okay? So here's a little demonstration of that. So let's see what you guys can do. So, our ears, as we get older, 
As we get older, the bones stiffen, the cartilage gets stiffer, and we lose our maximum hearing frequency. So I have no idea what the heck's going on with the leaf. But for the rest of us, as we get older, the highest frequency we can hear goes down. So for me, the highest I can hear is about 14,000. For most of you guys, it's about 16 or 17,000, and for Trenton, it was 18,000. So can you still like damage your ears with that? Like even if you can't hear it, like the no. same way that you can't hear no. To damage your ears, you gotta have somewhere in the range of about 500 to 2,000 hertz. All right, so. Some animals have higher hearing ranges than us. For example, dogs can hear almost up to 100,000 hertz. We can only hear up to 18 or 16,000. So if you make a, a whistle or a device that makes a noise at 25,000 hertz, no humans can hear it, but every dog can what we call dog whistle, right? And they make bark collars so that when the dog barks, it makes a high-pitched noise that no humans can hear, but it annoys the heck out of the dog so it stops barking. So um, animals which use echolocation tend to have very high frequency ranges. So like um, dolphins, for example, um, this is a log tail, so that goes up bats, and bats. Bats have the highest hearing frequency. All right, amplitude. So the wavelength is the distance between the waves, and the amplitude is how big the disturbance is. We have another word for amplitude. Frequency is pitch. What's another word for amplitude? If you have an amplifier, what does it do? It makes it louder. Yeah, the amplitude of the wave is also known as its loudness, okay? So that's why an amplifier makes it louder. It doesn't change the frequency. When you sing into a microphone, it doesn't make it a higher pitch. It just changes the amplitude. Instead of your little vocal cords making little tiny waves, there's a big, huge speaker that makes big waves at the same frequency, okay? So amplitude is um, sort of how big the wiggles are, how much energy is transferred. So if you have a bird make a little tiny peep, the pressure waves go up and down a little bit. If he's really mad and makes a loud beep, the frequency is the same. There's the same number of waves, but the pressure goes much higher or much lower. That's a bigger amplitude, that's a higher volume, okay? All right, so how fast does sound travel? 341 meters per second, right? Temperature, humidity, pressure vary that a little bit. But it turns out sound travels much faster in solids and liquids. So think about it. How does sound get from here to there? Well, my vocal cords have got to disturb a sound, uh, an air molecule, and that air molecule's got to move and knock its neighbor. And it's got to move and knock its neighbor. Well, there's not a whole lot of air in the room. The molecules are far apart. But what if it's in a solid? In a solid, the, the molecules are close together, and it's very easy and it happens quickly that they knock their neighbor and the information passes on. So in solids, the speed of sound is enormous. Instead of 341 in air, in steel it's almost 6,000, okay? That's 20 times faster. So you can do an experiment if you want. You can go to find a piece of railroad track and if you go a quarter of a mile away, then if you smack the track with a piece of wood, then you will hear the sound through the air about a second and a quarter later. Because that's how long it takes to go a quarter mile. But if your other ear is on the track, you'll hear the sound almost instantly because the sound travels through the steel 20 times faster. It also travels faster through water. So in water, it's pretty fast. Compare 15, uh, 1,500 versus 300, about five times faster, right? So sound travels faster in liquids and solids. Travels pretty slow in gases. Look at um, helium, though. In air, it's 331, 343, depending on the temperature. Look at helium. Because helium is lighter, it's moving faster to have the same kinetic energy, the same temperature. And if it's moving faster, the sound wave travels faster. So when you suck in a bunch of helium from a balloon, what happens to the pitch of your voice? It gets higher, yeah. 
because the sound is traveling faster. So if the velocity gets higher, so if you have, uh, remember the velocity is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. The wavelength is determined by the spacings in your vocal cords. And if the velocity gets bigger, because you're using helium, the frequency will get bigger. You get really high pitched, right? I don't know why. People always quote from the Wizard of Oz and they suck in helium. All of you. We've talked about that before. Okay, so it turns out that our ears, um, we perceive loudness in a weird way. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about for a little bit here. Okay, so intensity is the concentration of energy. Sometimes we talk about intensity as like the focus of something, right? They, they're really intense. Usually you mean they're like really focused. In science, though, intensity has to do with how much energy there is per unit of, of area, okay? So if I were to shine a light on um, a, a square, so I don't have an adjustable light, but imagine you shine a light on a circle like that, your light shines on there. It would be kind of bright. But what happens if you could focus all of that light onto a little tiny space? The same amount of light coming out of your flashlight, but it's focused on a little space. We would say this is much more intense, right? Yeah. It's the same energy in here, but it's on less area. So the energy, how the energy is spread out over the, air, over the area gets bigger, right? There's more energy per unit of area. So intensity is like a concentration of energy, all right? Technically, we're going to define intensity as the power divided by the area over which it's spread, okay? So that means that if you have one joule of energy arriving every second, that's one watt, and you divide that by the area, you get um, watts per square meter. So for the sun shining on us, for example, if you have a square meter, so think about, you lay a towel out in the sun, okay? It's about a square meter of towel is. It gets about 600 watts of energy or 600 joules of energy every second per square meter. So that is the intensity of the sunlight. It's 600 watts per square meter. That's how much energy is hitting it every second, that's the power, and the area, okay? So that's how we measure intensity. Now, what would happen if we were creating energy, sound waves, and they were spreading out? And what happens if you get farther and farther away? The intensity gets less and less. Imagine sound waves are spreading out and a certain amount of energy hits an area in your head, okay? If you went twice as far away, the same energy that had hit that area there would now hit this area. But the area, if you get twice as far away, the area gets four times bigger, right? So the energy per area, per unit of area, will get four times smaller, okay? Imagine you're spraying spray paint. If you spray paint on something close by, the paint all gets here. If you go twice as far away, the paint spreads out over four times as much area. So making, going twice as far away makes the area four times bigger, okay? So the way we calculate intensity of sound waves is we say, well, let's imagine the energy is going in all directions, okay? So if you are a distance R away from the sound wave, so right here is a tuning fork or something that's producing sound waves, so here's my tuning fork. The sound waves are spreading out in all directions. If I want to know the intensity over here at some distance R, if I want to know the intensity there, I've got to find the total energy that lands on this sphere. And you may or may not remember, or may or not have ever heard, the area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. That's the area of this whole sphere. So the intensity will be the power divided by the area, which is 4 pi r squared. Okay? So I'd like you to jot that in your toolbox. When you have a sound wave, the intensity of the sound wave 
how much energy there is spread out over space is given by the power divided by 4 pi r squared. No. If you have a source of energy and you want to know what is the intensity at distance r away, the intensity is the power divided by 4 pi r squared. So if I tell you you have a 300 watt speaker, that's the power. If you know how far away from it you are, you can calculate the intensity, how much energy there is. So that's how we calculate intensity, okay? And I'll do an example in a little bit. Now it turns out our hearing is really amazing. We can hear really, really, really tiny sounds, very, very small amounts of energy, and we can hear and process enormous amounts of energy, okay? So a rustling leaf, is about 10 to the negative 12 watts per meter squared. That's the intensity of the sound. Thunder can be as big as 1,000. So we can measure from 0 0.0000000001 watts per meter squared all the way up to about 1,000 watts per meter squared. Okay? That's a huge range. But our ears, in order to hear a range like that, they don't process sound linearly. If I turn the lights up so they are twice as bright, it'll appear twice as bright. But if I turn the volume up so there's twice as much, you don't hear it as twice as loud. It just sounds a little bit louder to you. Here's kind of why. Let's imagine we want to graph a couple of numbers. So here's my number line. Oops, I don't need that. Um, I guess I need that right there. There we go. How would you graph, if this is the number line that goes from zero to a million, where would you graph a million? That's here, right? Everybody good with that? Where would a thousand be? If this is zero to a million, where would a thousand be? Is that a thousand? This is what? That's a hundred thousand. So where's a thousand? Right there, right? Where's 10? Right there. Where's 0.1? Right there. Where's 0.0001? Can you tell any difference? No. When there's a huge range, plotting it on a linear scale doesn't allow you to separate them, right? Our ears work the same way. When there's a huge range of energies we can perceive, our ears can't process them on a linear scale. We actually use what's called a logarithmic scale. And that looks like this. If instead of graphing from zero to a million, I do powers of 10, right? Then here's one. 10 to the zero is one, right? That's, here's one. This is 100. That's a, th I'm sorry, that's 10. That's 100. That's a thousand, that's ten thousand, this is one hundred thousand, and that's a million. So if I wanted to plot a million, it's right there. What about a thousand? It's right there. What about ten? It's right there. What about point one? That's here. Point oh 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 one is there. A logarithmic scale using powers of ten allows us to separate numbers which fall on a huge range. And it turns out, for reasons we don't really understand, our ears work logarithmically because of the huge range we can hear. Okay, from 10 to the negative 12 all the way to 10 to the 3. So when we perceive sound, we don't perceive it linearly. We perceive it logarithmically. And so we've invented a sound scale that matches what our ears hear. It's called the decibel scale. You guys heard of decibels? Yeah. The decibel scale is the scale that matches what we hear. And it's kind of goofy looking. 
So this is how it works. Okay, don't panic. If you want to find the sound level, what things sound like to our ears, you've got to take the intensity divided by a constant, which is called the reference intensity, take the log of it, and multiply it by 10. So we call beta the sound level. All right? And you don't need to memorize this, because it's already in your toolbox. Or take a minute and put it in your toolbox if you want. So the decimal scale is a logarithmic scale that reflects how we hear sounds. And here's an example of some sound levels. A whisper, we say, is about 30 decibels. A mosquito, that's about 40 decibels. Normal conversations are about 60 decibels. A vacuum cleaner is about 70 decibels. If you're at a rock concert, back in the days when we used to go to concerts, 120 decibels, that's starting to hurt. That's physically painful for most people. The pressure waves are making your eardrums flat so much, they're starting to hurt, okay? And if you get all the way up to 150 decibels, that is so intense, those pressure waves can rip your eardrum, okay? And then you start bleeding and you can't hear anymore. So, to calculate the decimal level, we're going to do this. So, see, these numbers are really different, right? The threshold of hearing is what we're going to use in the bottom here, I0, 1 times 10 to negative 12. Every time the decimal level goes up by 10, that means the sound is 10 times louder, okay? So, here's how decibels work. Do I have an example of that? Yeah. So, Every time the decibel level gets 10 bigger. So if this is the sound level, in decibels, when you go from 30 to 40, to 50, to 60, to 70, every time the decibel level goes up by 10, the intensity gets 10 times bigger, so that's times 10. Going from 40 to 50 is another times 10. So going from 30 to 50 is what? How much louder? 10 times 10 or 100 times louder. Going from 30 all the way to 60 decibels is 1,000 times louder. So every time the decibel level goes up by 10, the sound gets 10 times louder, okay? Anybody ever seen uh, people working on the street with these headphones on thingies? They're sound reducing headphones. They just protect your hearing, right? This right here is rated at negative 30 decibels. So what does that mean if it's negative 30 decibels? Whatever sound you would hear without them will be 30 decibels less. So if your round sitting at 120 decibels, what do you hear? 90. 30 decibels less, in fact. And you can pay a lot of money and get negative 40 decibel hearing protection, but they're more expensive, okay? So 30 decibels, negative 30 decibels means it's reduced by 10 times 10 times 10 or reduced by 1,000 times, okay? Now, this is our equation. Sometimes we want to solve for the intensity and we are not going to assume you guys can manipulate logarithms, so I'm just going to give you the answer. If your plan is ever to solve this equation for i, you can just write in your next line, i equals this. If you've had 
logs before, you might recognize this as the log form of the equation and the exponential form of the equation. Is that familiar to anybody? That just those words? You test that out a little bit? You're probably not super fluent at it, so I'm just going to give it to you. So these are not two different equations. This is the equation for decibels. But if I give you the decibels and I ask you to find I, the intensity, you got to rearrange this using some properties of logs and exponents, and you'll get this equation here, okay? So I think on the toolbox I gave you, I have both of those, all right? So this is the main equation right here. Anybody know why you call them decibels? Named after somebody. Graham Bell, that's right. They named after Alexander Graham Bell. That's how they're called. And they're called decibels because it's multiples of 10. All right, let's solve an example. Suppose we've got a 50 watt speaker and you are four meters away. What will be the intensity and the sound level? So there's two equations we're working with here. So the first one is that the intensity, well, I think I have to. Here's my diagram. You are four meters away from a loudspeaker that's 50 watts. 50 watts is the power. Power is measured in watts, measured in watts. So the distance is four meters, the power is 50 watts. The first thing we want to do is find the intensity, okay? So the intensity is the power divided by four pi r squared. Grab your calculator. Make sure you group your denominator. Let's see if we can find the intensity. We don't need to solve for anything. It's already solved, so we just say evaluate, right? Some of your solutions are you're still saying all kinds of goofy stuff. Like you're saying, solve I for I. So it's not good. Right? What do you get for I? Eli? Yeah, 0.249.25. Keep that on your screen. That's the intensity. And if you're a sound engineer, that's what you work with. But if you're talking about human perception, we gotta convert it to decibels so we know kind of how loud that sounds to us. So to convert it to decibels, we're gonna plug it in this equation. We're gonna take the log of i, that answer, divided by i zero, which is just 10 to the negative 12. We're gonna multiply it by 10, and that's going to be the decibel level, which gives us an idea of how loud it sounds to us. So see if you can stick that in your calculator. Make sure you group your denominator. Does everybody know where their log key is? It should say L-O-G on there. Josh? 113. 113. 113. That's about right. 113.9? 100, yeah. yeah. So about 114. So that's pretty darn loud. Four meters from a 50 watt speaker is pretty loud. Okay? Anything over 100 decibels is going to hurt. Does that make sense how we did that? We're just going to solve a couple problems like that. Uh, now, let me do one more. Let's work backwards. Suppose the jackhammer has an, a decibel level or a sound level of 125 decibels. How do you find the intensity? Well, you got a jackhammer sending out sound waves. You know the sound level, and you're trying to find I. So we're going to solve this equation for I. Okay, that's my plan. You need to show the steps that get you I by itself. No, we're gonna let you punt this time. We're just gonna write it down. The exponential form is I equals I zero times 10 to the power of beta over 10. But we gotta plug it in still. So see if you can plug this in. Take I zero, that's one times 10 to the negative 12, times 10 to the power of 125 over 10. That's beta over 10, 125 over 10. Plug that in. Got it there, Gus? 